This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. We have a lot of licenses. Our driver's license, a license plate, creative license if you're a writer. James Bond had a license to kill. But there's still even more if you need to plan on hunting, fishing, or trapping in the state of Kentucky. We go inside outdoors to talk about the varied interest in wildlife recreation and just what you need to be legal. Not to mention, proceeds from these licenses keep our outdoors outstanding. It's all next on Kentucky Field Radio. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear, flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The Natural Tax Shelter. When I'm 15, I'm going to be prom queen. When I'm 15, I'm going to have my own limo and private jet. 15 is a good year. Just ask Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. To honor our 15th anniversary of elk hunting, the new Pick 4 option doubles your chance to take home a trophy. When I'm 15, I'm going elk hunting. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Is 2015 your lucky number? Get your elk permit and dream big. SW.KY.GOV. This is Kentucky Field Radio, and this is a topic that has become an annual tradition. This time of year, we're talking about the sporting license you need in Kentucky. Fishing licenses, hunting licenses, trapping, the various additional stamps and permits you might need for deer and for trout, waterfowl, certain wildlife management areas. Routine for some, I'm sure, but likely... A review is always helpful. And in the studio, I have Denise Babinger, who is in charge of Kentucky's licensed sales system. Her mic sounds fine. Brian Clark is also in the studio, wildlife biologist by trade, now the assistant director of the Kentucky Division of Public Affairs, sort of the fish and wildlife marketing arm. And Brian, your mic sounds good as well, but on the phone. Telephone's giving me fits. Fish and Wildlife Conservation Officer Rufus Cravens from Clark County. Sounds more like a little green man calling from Mars, but that's just barely marginal, but I'm going to use it because I'd hate to not have Rufus Cravens a part of this. Mm -hmm. I'll have to get my crack staff in here that know everything about electronics to fix this. (laughs) Anyway, Rufus Cravens, we welcome you to the show. Thank you. Denise Babinger, how long have you been doing Kentucky Direct sales system? We have actually been doing that for about 16 years now. I remember, and Brian, you do too, this will never work. Yeah, you go to the sporting goods store to buy your hunting license and fishing license, and now it's all being done electronically. Did a lot of people go into this with some skepticism? Well, it took a few years of planning, and then we brought in some consultants to work another year or so. So it was quite a few years in the works before we got to our final product, which is still being changed every time we find something that we need to do again. So it's still evolving? Yes. What has been the latest evolution? We are going more online onto our own website. Hopefully in the next three or four years, agents out in the community will be doing it uh, web-based sales instead of actually the little POS oh. machines that look like the credit cards. Yeah, it looks like a credit card thing. Mm-hmm. Right? I was wondering... The license that anyone in the field will need after March 1st, is any license optional? It depends on where you're fishing, where you're hunting, and how old you are. If you're on your own property, you don't need one. If you're a resident of Kentucky. And what about this uh, I'm a tenant farmer type thing? Does that still apply? It still does, but you have to make sure you are actually living on the property and making your living off the property. Officer Cravens, that going on in Clark County? 
Yes, yeah, well, you, yeah, you check several people that, you know, um, that say, yeah, I'm a tenant farmer, you know, I work for Mr. Smith or whoever and live on his property. You, you still see it quite common, and, and you do see a lot of people who, well, I won't say a lot, but you, it's not uncommon to see people who are claiming that tenant status, but who actually are not considered by definition a tenant as well. In Clark County, everybody over there obeys the law, don't they? Yes. <laughs> yeah, what a thought. I don't know why we have you on here. That's right. But you're going to speak for every conservation officer in the state. You were in the field, Officer Cravens, and a lot of people know you as Rufus. And right. you see things that a lot of people don't. It's one thing for folks from Frankfurt to sit here and say, here's what the law is. But you are actually in the field. And you interact with these people on a daily basis. Is there one thing out there that that they find confusing or difficult or somewhere in a gray area when it comes to licenses and permits? Probably one of one of the most common things that that you see, uh, and, and it happens more so. It seems to be in in younger people that may be just getting involved into hunting or fishing. Um, but people will, you'll check people and they won't have, they may have like in deer season, they may have a deer permit but no hunting license or vice versa. They may have a hunting license and no deer permit. And when you talk to them about it, uh, a lot of them will say, well, I went to such and such, whatever retail establishment it was that they purchased their license from. And they'll say, well, this is, this is what the woman at the counter told me that this was all I needed to hunt deer or, you know, this is what the man told me this, this was all I needed to hunt, uh, hunt dove and they'll have one or the other and you know that's pretty common and and you know i usually just explain to them it's not the retail establishment's responsibility to give you what you need it's your responsibility to make sure they give you what you ask for and for you yourself to know what you need what about the guy who goes before the judge and said your honor i tried in good faith and yet i got written up what happens well it you know, it, it just depends. Uh, you know, it kind of depends on different things. If that person's got a storied past, that they've been in trouble before and that sort of thing. You know, I have seen cases where the judge will let the uh, individual purchase the license or the permit and and show that as proof and dismiss it. And then I've seen cases where they, you know, will uh, make them pay a fine on it for not having the appropriate license or permit. I went online, Brian and Denise, and I counted... 42, 42 different permits and licenses that you could conceivably need. Yes, that's why it's so important to read those regulations, those guidebooks that are now even posted on our website. So they they go on our website a lot earlier than what you would find out in the stores. I don't want to make Frankfurt Fish and Wildlife mad at me, but is there <laughs> maybe a way to simplify it from 42 down to maybe for because I think anybody would want to ask that. That's a good question. And the agency, we and, and other state fish and wildlife agencies have been working hard the last several years to try to make the license and permits simpler or more streamlined. But in many cases, there are outside funding sources, grant sources that we're able to tap into through through selling different licenses and permits. And then also uh, those monies are directed to different programs based on license and permit sales. So it's it's actually the way we have those divided up are actually important. And we, we regret that there is some confusion there. We try to streamline those as much as possible. And also encourage people if they have a question. It's not clear from the hunting guide that Denise mentioned uh, or fishing guide for a given year or season. They can always call us at 1-800-858-1549 and speak to our information center and ask a question, okay, what what do I need to dove hunt or what do I need to deer hunt, especially from a, from a different state? Because some states, they have a, a deer license, a turkey license, mm-hmm. whereas in Kentucky we have licenses that cover general hunting privileges or fishing privileges, and then we have specific permits that cover different species of game or fish. Or you could just go, about this is what I've always needed. I trust this is what I need next year. The one thing that's come up, maybe the $5 license for seniors. Mm -hmm. Sportsman's license is something new. Mm -hmm. But even if you forewent those and say, well, this is what I had last year, a fishing license, for example, they'd probably be pretty good as long as they're not doing what? Fishing for trout? Yeah, if, if, if they purchased a license and they had what they needed for 
2014 to 15, and they're they're purchasing license for the 2015 to 16 season. Uh, we didn't have any major changes this year. We did have a, a, some changes in structure and also fees for uh, the license year that's just ended. But uh, for 2015-16, we don't have any major changes. So um, no major changes. Cool. Go Frankfurt. That's rare. <laughs> If you have no license, or if you have the wrong license, does that make you a poacher? You'll find out. We've got to get to a break. My name is Charlie Baglin, and you are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. You know, it's time to renew, or it's time to buy new if you're new to the sport. If you like to hunt, fish, want to give it a try. As of March 1st, you need a new hunting or fishing or trapping license. That's March 1st, not January 1st. Uh, before you go out anywhere, do anything outdoors after March 1st, you just need to make sure your license and permit, everything's up to date. Denise Babinger and Brian Clark from the capital city of Kentucky, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, are in the studio with me. And Officer Rufus Cravens is on the phone from his post in Clark County. A hunting license, a fishing license, pretty commonplace. But there's a bunch of licenses out there. What is the least purchased? And I'm wondering if it is the non-resident out-of-zone elk hunting permit that you can buy for $350. That looks about like it, and that and the the new bear permits that we've got out there that's um there is a limit on the total take for the season right mm-hmm. like what's it 10 12 what is it now it's 10 for the archery crossbow season and then 10 for the firearm season mm-hmm. and only residents of kentucky can hunt bear is there any other season in the state that you have a total take limit am i using the right definition you are there are in in some cases for waterfowl for example the sandhill cranes we have a daily uh, check system like denise mentioned for bears where hunters have to check before they hunt the next day have to check at night or first thing in the morning to make sure the the season quota hasn't been reached officer cravens i wanted to ask you being in the field you've heard some pretty good stories along the way of why you didn't have a license why you took what you took Whatever that excuse is that you're given, and I do want to hear some, I'm wondering if simply because someone is hunting or fishing or trapping illegally, if they're out of season, have the wrong permit, wrong time of day, is that considered poaching? How do you define poaching? Well, I think as far as the poaching goes, the definition of poaching, you know, I think that's kind of one of those, to me, it's one of those that probably... You could ask 10 people and get 10 different definitions. For me personally, you know, the guy that goes out and, and, and in good faith possibly just doesn't buy the correct license or, you know, has the license and not the permit, I myself don't really define that as a poacher. They're a violator, but when I think of a poacher, to me, I think of the guy that's out here spotlighting deer at night, shooting them or killing deer out of season for the sport of it killing a buck and checking it in under Papa's name and another one under his wife's name and another yeah. one under the kid's name and it taking multiple multiple bucks that sort of thing that that's what I when I think of poacher um, that's kind of more my definition of it. it's a flagrant disregard right. exactly right malicious intent when they go out to basically you know rape the resource yeah, and sometimes people don't realize they have to have a license. For example, we, uh, over the last several years, have developed a, a fantastic fishing in neighborhoods program, or FINS, and we have lakes in lots of different uh, urban centers or population centers around the state. And I think historically the officers have done a great job with working with people to let them know, okay, you you have to have a license to fish here. This is not a, on private property. It's a public fishery. And a lot of folks early on in that program were showing up 
just fishing uh, at will and did not have a license. There's an education process there, as, as Officer Cravens mentioned, where some folks who are new to the, to the field, uh, fishing or hunting, have to learn, and they don't understand necessarily that they're required to have a license or that there are different kinds. And so there is an education process uh, for folks who are getting into the into the sport. Yeah, we get that issue with farm ponds also. People will call up and say, I'm going to my cousin's farm pond down west. Since he owns it and it's private, do I need a license? Mm -hmm. Yes, you need a license. You can only hunt there if you own the land or you're a dependent of the landowner. You're a license holder yourself, I know. Mm -hmm. You and your husband. I remember seeing you on Kentucky Field Television (laughs) way back. I mean, way back. Um, I want to tell you, Brian and Officer Cravens, let me tell you about this. There was a time when I was associated more with Kentucky Field Television Show, okay. and it was over Christmas. I was just digging through a box and said, well, looky here. And there we had a VHS tape. And it was 1995 Kentucky Field Christmas. It was Tim Farmer's very first one hosting of a Christmas show. He had started like the September before. I remember that, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Denise was on there. And you were shooting, I don't know if it was Flintlock or, or something. You remember the piece? Yeah, it was the Flintlock, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I remember that. She still looks 25 years she old. Does. Oh. She has that gift. I don't know how she does. It. Y'all are both wearing glasses, I see. <laughs> but it's nice to have people on the show that actually walk the walk, talk the talk. You were mentioning that we were talking about the the strange, the unheard of licenses and permits that Kentucky has to offer. And I counted 42. The most popular is going down in sales. I've been looking at these. I have reports here that I would uh, got off the Internet. It starts out like 1967 and goes all the way through the present. And so you take hunting and fishing licenses and the joint fishing licenses going down in sales. But the sportsman license is taking up the slack. Let's talk about that sportsman's license. Is it still as popular as it has, has it peaked yet? Do people still need to be aware of it and take advantage of the savings? Yes, it goes up every year since we've started it. And since, you know, it includes both the hunting and their fishing license, their trout permit, their migratory bird and waterfowl permit, and their deer tag and their turkey tags also. So it's a great deal for the $95 price. What what is it missing? There's there's something missing. Is it the trout stamp, waterfowl? What's what's missing in there? No, the trout and the waterfowl is there. If they're going to hunt geese, they'll need their federal stamp, which they can get at their local post office. And the additional doe tags are not included. Now, the $5 license, and I think that's just sort of a nickname for the senior license, is it essentially the same thing as a sportsman's license? It's the same, and it also includes the additional deer tags. So it's even a better deal. So you have to be 65? 65, yes. Well, that's a deal. And, no, you can't beat and, the deal. Yeah, and those license numbers are increasing every year also, which means we're losing out on some of the other licenses that they used to purchase. Yeah. Officer Cravens, when you're in the field and you say, let me see your license, what license are you seeing more? Do you see more of these sportsmen's licenses being presented to you? I, yeah, I do see. I do see a tremendous amount of the sportsman's license. That's what I personally purchase every year myself, and uh, I, I have seen a seems like a steady incline in the number of people that you check. Um, you know that that do purchase that every year, and then uh, one that I one that I've also seen that seems like is increasing is not necessarily well, it's the same license, but not the senior side of the license, but the disability side. Uh, it's kind of amazing the number of people you check in their in their thirties and forties now that that have a disability license and have the you know the disability exemption permit to show to go along with. It. There's a junior version of the sportsman's license, so if you're 16 or older. 
you'd be required to have an adult or the standard license. Mm-hmm. At 15, technically, you're not required to have a hunting license until you're 12. So from 12 to 15, you can purchase the junior uh, or the, the youth sportsman's or the youth hunting license. And we encourage folks to develop a pattern or develop a, a habit and ethic of, of purchasing that license with their youth each year, even if they're below 12. And that does a couple of things. It, it, it sort of inculcates in the youth that that habit, that desire to contribute to the resource. So they're putting back, even though it's just a small amount, you know, $6 for a hunting license or $30 for the sportsman's license. But in addition to that habit, it also it does contribute to the, the funds that we have available for conservation. And we also, in addition to those license revenues, we also take these license dollars and we're able to gain federal grant dollars using the state dollars as match. And so those Every single license sale means we can get more federal grant dollars and other uh, funds to be able to improve the, the resources we have here in Kentucky. So we encourage folks to develop that habit even before age 12 of purchasing that license. Fishing, you still do not need a license until you're 16. But the hunting, starting at age 12... You need okay. to buy the appropriate license. We've seen an uptick in participation over what we've seen over the last several years, uh, the last couple of years in fishing and then uh, hunting as well. So we, we're on, fortunately, kind of an uptick in, in both in license sales and participation based on surveys. So we're, we're optimistic that people are getting out more to enjoy the great resources we have in Kentucky, but then also in some cases to, uh, to harvest some of their own local food. We believe the economy, the downturn, the economy the last several years is probably having an impact on that. People want to get out and harvest some venison or some small game or some fish to help fill the freezer. Self-sufficiency. Pretty much what hunting and fishing has been about since forever. Talking about the licenses you need for the coming new year after March 1st. Just ahead is our fishing report and back with more. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. Bagman back on Kentucky Field Radio. If you want to listen to the show again or email the link to a friend or post it on Facebook, it's easy to do. Go to myhuntingandfishing.com. You'll find us there. We are also a podcast on iTunes. Just put Kentucky Field Radio in the search box. There we are. Same thing goes for YouTube. Kentucky Field Radio, and there we are. Time now for our fishing report. <laughs> In western Kentucky, down in Kentucky, and Barkley Lakes, well, brr, it's cold fishing out there. And so you just got to pick and choose your days. If you can catch you a nice, calm day when the sun's out just a little bit and you can go out there and stand the air temperature, crappie are out there to be caught. Just head on out to the, the deeper ledges down at the mouth of the embayments, the secondary creek channels. A lot of people spider rig or drift fish this time of year with a jig, maybe a jig tipped with a minnow. You're fishing in anywhere from 10 to, to 30 feet, just going out there looking for those schooled up crappie near the ledges. The tailwaters, right now the water levels are down, and so striped bass down there, catfish down there, it's a good time to go down there. Snagging is also a big thing for the silver carp in the tailwaters. But this time of year, you just got to pick and choose your days. Well, this is Paul Reister, and I hope you find a good day to go fishing. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central Fishery Fishing Report. Water temperatures are in the upper 30s, with many lakes and streams partially covered in ice. The two species of interest this time of year are sauger and trout. Sauger are beginning to stage below many of our locks and dams on the Ohio and Kentucky rivers. Try live minnows or a variety of jigs, spoons, or minnow imitating lures to catch these fish. Please observe all boating regulations when fishing below these locks and dams due to possible dangerous water conditions and protect yourself from the cold weather conditions. And finally, a few crappie are still being caught at many of our area lakes such as Taylorsville or Harrington Lakes. So grab your pole and enjoy some great wintertime fishing. Remember to dress appropriately when fishing in cold weather condition and always wear your life jacket. This is Rob Rold in the Northwestern Fishery District with an update on angling opportunities in our area. Rough River Lake and Nolan River Lake, anglers have been catching crappie by fishing along the main channel and the tributary channel breaks. I look for brush piles in those areas especially, and they're holding more crappie. Sauger fishing has been fairly good on the Ohio River uh, below the major locks and dams, that being Candleton, Newburgh, and Uniontown. 
Trout were stocked at the Peabody Lakes on the 21st last week. The trout lakes of Peabody are Rob's Lake, Access Lake, and Flycatcher Lake. Trout will be stocked this week in Morton's Lake on uh, Higginson Henry Wildlife Management Area, as well as at Sandy Watkins Park in Henderson County. So be safe on the water, and good luck fishing. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The natural tax shelter. When I'm 15, I'm going to be prom queen. When I'm 15, I'm going to have my own limo and private jet. 15 is a good year. Just ask Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. To honor our 15th anniversary of elk hunting, the new Pick 4 option doubles your chance to take home a trophy. When I'm 15, I'm going elk hunting. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Is 2015 your lucky number? Get your elk permit and dream big. Back on Kentucky Field Radio, my name is Charlie Baglin. And you know, it's very easy to label people who hunt and fish, and not all the time is it really fair. Many people pride themselves in making fewer trips to the grocery store, and they'll do this by raising a garden. You may have chickens on your property and gather your own eggs, growing apples, a cherry tree, beekeeping, gathering their own honey, making cider. And if you want good food from the good earth, and certainly fishing and hunting, fit right in there. Especially with this organic, hormone-free, free-range option that people want these days. Another way to say that is homegrown. Now, Brian and Officer Cravens, there was a class recently that you two were a part of called the Field to Fork Workshop. I remember it. Nature and Nutrition Meet the Kitchen, so fill me in. Absolutely. We've had a workshop in Louisville for the last three years, uh, just at the beginning of deer season, to provide an opportunity for folks that didn't have the uh, experience or um, opportunity, perhaps growing up, to go hunting, but were interested in harvesting their own local meat uh, to learn how to deer hunt. And so we've had these weekend workshops, and we've had 20 to 30 people each of the last three years participate in those. Uh, This last year in the fall, we offered in Lexington a similar course, and uh, we titled it Field to Fork because we wanted to emphasize that field-to-table component of going hunting and, and obtaining your own local meat and, uh, you know, chemical-free, additive-free, and put that out there for folks that do want to raise their own garden or otherwise, you know, get their own free-range organic meat uh, because uh, what better way to do it, you know, than to get this high-protein, uh, low-fat, healthful, free-range meat by, you know, doing it yourself. And so we offered this workshop, and Officer Cravens and uh, numerous other staff helped us to teach that or teach different aspects of of hunting from regulations all the way through to how to cook the product. So it was very well received. We had uh, a full class. We had 20 participants, and we got really good reviews on the class. And uh, all those folks went out and went hunting after, either with us as part of the course or with other mentors that they had uh, already, whether a spouse or a parent or a friend or someone like that. And uh, so they're on their way to becoming experienced hunters. Do you have many females that come to your class? We do. So we typically have between 20 and 30 percent females. Yeah. And interestingly, it's a good point, Denise. Uh, participation by females nationally is up. And uh, I think something on the order of 9 or 10 percent na- nationally participation in hunting is uh, up uh, in terms of female participation. And then uh, we've had a significant increase in the number of females that participate in our hunter ed classes. So I think we're up in the 20 to 30 percent range each year of a hunter ed students that are females. Have you mentioned the age group that attends these? Uh, no, that's a good point. So for these uh, the workshops for getting folks involved in hunting, typically they're young adults. They're folks who are in their 20s, 30s, maybe 40s. And we've had some, some older folks too, some seniors. But um, most of them are young adults and 
They're very into self sustenance, you know, providing their own food uh, from vegetables to, to meat. I mean, these folks raise their own chickens or they have a, you know, micro farm. Um, and uh, we think it's exciting. We think it's a group of folks that historically we may have missed, we may not have reached, and so we're trying to reach out to them with opportunities and provide some training that, that, that again, they may not have gotten growing up if they were raised in a you know an urban environment or somewhere without a mentor. Are these still going on? Or? We anticipate expanding that program beyond Lexington and Louisville, potentially starting with northern Kentucky and then branching out from there across the state because we've had, when we're advertising for those, we had significant response from other areas. And so we anticipate expanding those. One challenge we have as an agency is we don't have capacity necessarily to hire additional staff. Mm-hmm. So in developing these programs, we have to work with partners and increase our capacity that way. So with volunteers, partnering organizations, other agencies to be able to tap enough folks you know, statewide to, to offer things like this. A college, a university, uh, who was that that was also involved in this? Yeah, Sullivan University really helped us out a great deal. They helped us in terms of uh, marketing for the program or promotion. So we really appreciate Sullivan being a partner with us and Chef McBride and uh, Ruby Jean's Restaurant, uh, the cafe there in Lexington, for for hosting uh, one of our elements for our program. Back to the licenses available in Kentucky that you will need if you want to hunt or fish or trap legally. There's a lot to choose from. And I printed this off the web just out of curiosity. you got the annual fishing, joint husband and wife fishing. But let's just say somebody who doesn't know, and granted this is old hat for a lot of people. Uh-huh. But if you don't know or you're just curious or you're listening from out of state, you say, yeah, I'd like to go down there and check Cumberland out or check out some of those rivers and streams. What do they need to know? If somebody wanted to come in, let's say, just fish. Well, a non-resident, they can buy the annual, or we have short-term licenses also. It's a one-day, seven-day, and 15-day. One-day, seven-day, and 15-day. Mm-hmm. Or they could buy an annual license, come over here all the time and fish. Mm-hmm. We welcome them. They would also need a trout permit, if, right, if they're... If they're trout fishing. Any other permits that they would need that may pop up and surprise them? Not in fishing. Okay. As for hunting, what are the options for anybody coming in? One of the major confusions we have, uh, if they are large game hunting, turkey, deer, elk, they have to purchase the annual non-resident hunting license along with their permit. Okay. They can't purchase that five-day license to hunt big game. Yeah, you've got to have that annual, in other words, the year-round license, not just a short-term license. Gotcha. And any permits that need to go along that are coming in for deer season, you got to get your permits, mm-hmm. plus the annual out-of-state license. Correct. Yes, and we'll mention, too, the non-residents are eligible to purchase those additional deer permits that Denise mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. So those are just a one fee for residents and non-residents, and it's a great deal for non-residents who they do have to purchase a higher price license. And so while they're here, if they have opportunity to get more than two deer, they could harvest a couple of additional deer on that additional deer permit and you know take, take home some additional venison that way. Officer Cravens is still on the line with us in God's Country in Clark County. That's a little bit east of Lexington, Winchester area. How often do you see out of state non-resident hunters and fishermen you know, when you're out on patrol? You see a few. Seems like during dove season, opening weekend of dove season where it usually corresponds, or if it falls on the um, Labor Day weekend, you'll check quite a few out-of-state dove hunters, I guess, coming in for the long weekend to visit and that sort of thing. So that that's probably the one time a year that I actually check the most out-of-state hunters is on, on dove fields like that. Uh, and then you do check, you know, I check a few deer uh, deer hunters that are out of state and a few spring turkey hunters. The main bodies of water that I work over here are the Kentucky River. My my unit, we cover the particular unit I work or group of guys I work with, we cover the Kentucky River from Lock 9 there at Valley View Ferry on upriver to the north, south, and middle fork up in Lee County. So we don't check very many out-of-state fishermen on the Kentucky River. You know, I think a lot of those go more to the lakes and, and stuff than they do the Kentucky River. But uh, like I said, as far as hunting goes, we check quite a few that are out-of-state hunters. 
So that basically wraps it up for non-resident hunting and fishing. Of course, we've got trapping we could talk about, but do we get that much demand in the state for for trapping? No, it's it's. I guess a few years ago, trapping wasn't um, the fur co- fur prices weren't very well, so our trapping numbers went down. But they're starting to climb back up again. What are the hot animals out there people are, are in search of? <laughs> you know, coyotes are very popular for hunters and trappers mm-hmm. both. But, yeah, coyotes are popular. And then some of the staple uh, fur bears, raccoons, mink, mm-hmm. weasel. Those species are very popular fox. Mm-hmm. And you said mink, and I was going to say that everyone's heard of a mink coat. Mm-hmm. Maybe not in vogue today like they were in the 50s, but there are mink in Kentucky, and I have seen them. Yeah, most but people, it's a rarity. Yes, it is. And most people that see them, they, they see them crossing a road at night or maybe, uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. like a road kill. They see them on the side of the road or in the road uh, because they're going from one section of a water body to another or one area of wetland to another. They tend to be more aquatic, although they certainly are terrestrial. They, they will live on land, spend part of their time on land, but they do spend a fair bit of time in the water also. Do you have a fox stole, Denise? And no, but there is a mink coat in my closet. There is a mink coat in her closet. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't purchased for me. It was my uh, mother-in-law's who passed away a couple years ago, so it's now residing in my closet. Nice. And I didn't mention, Charlie, but, but bobcats are also a popular fur bear. And we've, uh, in the last few years, seen increasing numbers of bobcats mm-hmm. harvested and based on hunter observations and trappers. Uh, there appear to be a lot of bobcats out there. And so they're, they're a popular species of people uh, harvest those to sell the, the hides to. Mm-hmm. So the annual trapping license cost for resin, 20 bucks, right? We haven't really talked about the prices of these, but let's let's, let's hit those quickly. A fishing license, what, 20 bucks? A hunting license costs what? $20. $20 more dollars. Or you can get a combination. For that's 30. Right, for 30. That's a, that's a bargain mm-hmm. if you hunt and fish, but don't necessarily pursue big game where you might need a sportsman's license. Joint husband and wife. Or you can buy the sportsman license. Yeah, yeah it's a great value. For 95 bucks, you can get $150 worth of, of license mm-hmm. and permits there. And the junior license costs how much? The junior sportsman's license? Uh, 30. 30, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so junior hunting is. Um, the, the, that's six for the residents, mm-hmm. and then the sportsman's, which incorporates deer and turkey permits, is 30. So it's a, it's a great bargain for those who would deer and turkey hunt. So you're saying a, a kid that's under 16 can get all that for $30. Mm-hmm. That's a deal. That's a fantastic deal. Why you wouldn't buy that? A lot cheaper than an Xbox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are telling you what you need to know before you go hunting and fishing license-wise. We'll be back with our final few. My name is Charlie Baglin. Stay with us. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. Baglin back on Kentucky Field Radio in our final few with Denise Babinger and Brian Clark. They are both experts on hunting and fishing licenses with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. And on the telephone is Conservation Officer Rufus Cravens, assigned to Clark County. And let me say this. If you go to McDonald's, this probably happened to you. You say, I want a burger, I want fries, and I want a Coke. And the person will come back and say, you know, that'd be cheaper If you bought the combo meal number six or whatever it is. So buying a hunting and fishing license sort of works the same way. If you're going to hunt and fish, it's cheaper, and we'll tell you up front, it's cheaper to buy the combo license. But that said, some people willingly pay more than they need to. They will gladly pay that a la carte price or pay full price because they appreciate where the money goes and what it supports. 
Absolutely. We, yeah. we hear feedback from a number of sportsmen mm-hmm. each year that, that basically tell us that when they come in to renew or uh, interact with us at shows and expos, things like that. They say, you know, I'm eligible for the senior license, but I'm going to go ahead and pay the 95 because right. I, I like what I'm investing right. in. You don't have to buy the senior or the disabled. You can go ahead and buy the regular license. It happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some yeah. licenses that we haven't hit, permits that are needed, like for the Peabody, the user permit there, land between the lakes, hunter user permit. Are these things that you should just consider buying if you know you're going to be there anyway uh, March 1st? Yeah, if you know that you're going to go to Peabody, uh, it kind of keeps all your licenses on one license forms instead of having three or four in your wallet and you got to figure out which one you need to show the officer. So if you if you do know that you're going to Peabody or you're going deer hunting in the fall, yeah, I'd go ahead and purchase them if they were able to. Yeah, Charlie, one thing we haven't talked about yet, which I want to give a quick shout-out before we run out of time, is we had a little bit of a change this year in our elk hunt application process. So we're allowing folks to purchase four entries instead of just two. In the past few years, we've had just a pick-two system, as we call it. And beginning this year, folks can apply for all four. That would be bull, firearm, bull, archery cow firearm and cow archery nice. and so depending on their interests if they want to apply for one they could do that or go up to, up to four and those are mm-hmm. still $10 per entry and that goes through April 30th that's right and then the youth elk. In addition to the, the standard drawing for all the, the majority of the permits, which this year is 900 for 2015, we also have 10 permits that are set aside just for youth. So we'll have 910 total permits, 10 of those de- dedicated for mm-hmm. youth. And so youths could apply for five, okay. apply for four, and then an extra bonus there apply for those, <laughs> those youth permits as well. One other change that we have um, is with the migratory bird waterfowl permits. In the past, you went to your agent and purchased your permit, and they were supposed to ask you questions on whether you hunted last year, how many doves you killed, and some agents weren't doing that. So we have taken that survey off the machine, and hunters that are purchasing migratory bird or waterfowl, or it's included in their license, such as the sportsman's, need to go to our website and get on their profile, and there's a survey that they can take there in their profile, and then it'll give them a confirmation number to put on their license. Okay. Yeah, I personally had that experience where the the license mm-hmm. vendor, like yeah. our, our website was having trouble, or it was I was having to be at a license vendor and go ahead and purchase my license for the year, and and I asked the the shopkeep, you know, I said, well, mm-hmm. you're going to ask me about the migratory bird harvest, and uh, it's called HIP in the U.S. Fish mm-hmm. and Wildlife Service system, Harvest Information Program, I think. But uh, sometimes they would, they, the clerk was not aware of those those uh, the need to do that to ask that permit, so or ask those survey mm-hmm. questions. This sort of circumvents that need, which is helpful. Yes. Yeah, God love of all that will help you and me buy a license but if my job is to mix paint i don't know (laughs) all of these things so it helps you personally to do your homework of what you need to buy questions you might need to ask Mm -hmm. you know and take a look at it when you get it to double check that you got what you need yes especially during the time between december 1st and march the 1st there are both license years are sold if you're wanting this next current season that starts in march make sure you have a large five on top of that license and they didn't sell you another license for the season that's going to end in the end of february like i said i i would urge people to do the same thing you know if they if they don't know like you said go go to the hunting guide or our website or call the department but uh you know, if you go into that retail establishment and expect them to know what you're supposed to have, you may get the person that works in a different department that just happened to be covering <laughs> by the person that works sporting goods is on break. Yeah. They may have never hunted or fished their entire life. All they do is know how to run the machine. So don't ever, uh, you know, leave that responsibility on the person working the machine to tell you what you need or don't need. It's ultimately your responsibility to, to know when you go in there and then, to double check to make sure you get what you ask for. Pretty much at the end of the show, officer, but I would like to be a fly on the wall somewhere out in the woods uh, listening to some of the excuses you may get from sportsmen or women or kids or whatever who don't have the license they need. Tell me a story or two. I can remember one time down in uh, Locks, 
7, which is down in Wilmore in Jessamine County on the Kentucky River, checking some individuals one day about uh, for fishing license. Watched them for a few minutes, and they were fishing. Didn't catch anything, but I was, you know, I was sure that they were fishing. There was a group of them. I can't remember if there was three or four, but... Uh, Anyway, I walked down there, made sure that they were all actively fishing, and walked down there to check their license, and uh, none of them had a license. And when I got to asking them about, you know, didn't you realize you were supposed to have a license? And they said that uh, that they were, and they never told me who, but they said that they were told they only needed a license if they were going to keep the fish. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter. That's kind of like... Um, you know, kind of like playing the lottery. Uh, yeah. You know, me, me watching the Powerball numbers or the Mega Millions <laughs> numbers, and then and then going to the store after the fact and saying, "Hey, can I buy a ticket for the, you know, for the drawing?" We just, yeah. So it doesn't really work that way. FW.ky.gov is a great place to go when you want to know what you need. And two other options would be the current hunting, fishing, boating guide. Uh, guides uh, and uh, the telephone number you can call during the business day and talk is what, Brian? It's 1 800 858 1549. I appreciate y'all being here today. Thank, Thank you, you Charlie. Right. Thank you. The new license year in Kentucky begins March 1st and runs through next February. Buy your license at many stores or online at fw.ky.gov. We are out of time. This is Charlie Bagman inviting you to join us in a week, and we will go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Field Radio.